Okay, hello everybody. Good afternoon to our Mid-Columbia chapter members, uh, colleagues in the Public Relations Society of America, wherever you may be, our returning friends of the Mid-Columbia chapter and uh, those new, new friends joining us here for uh, the first time today. I'm Mike Paoli, your host, a past co-president of the Mid-Columbia chapter, and very honored to be a panelist with Angela Billings, joining us from sunny and warm Frankfort, Kentucky. And uh, give us a wave, Angela. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Cool. Thank you. And Jocelyn McKay, zooming in from sunny Olympia today. <laughs> I'm speaking to you on a cool, sunny day from Edwards Air Force Base in California's Mojave Desert. Uh, if you haven't done it already, please do us a favor and let us know in the chat what town you're in right now, uh, regardless of what uh, town, state, even country you're in. Uh, you're always welcome to join PRSA on our own active and dynamic chapter based here in the Tri-Cities uh, or up there for me in the Tri-Cities, mm -hmm. the mighty Columbia River. Our membership is demographically and geographically diverse. And for uh, Washington, we are second in size only to Jocelyn's Puget Sound chapter. And speaking of Jocelyn, uh, Jocelyn has worked with private industry state government, various associations, and uh, most challenging, in my opinion, K through 12 education. Uh, she has a PRSA accreditation in public relations. She is the owner and founder of Jocelyn McCabe Public Relations. She recently served as vice president of communications for the Association of Washington Business. Our, that's our state's chamber of commerce. And prior to that, she was communications director for the Association of Washington Schools principals and the state superintendent of public, uh, and for the state superintendent uh, of public instruction. Uh, before her own PR business, she worked at APCO Worldwide uh, out of Seattle, I believe, and was the information officer for the Washington State House of Representatives. So Jocelyn, our chapter is thrilled you accepted our invitation to share such diverse experience. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for well, having me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sitting next to Jocelyn, virtually, <laughs> is Angela Billings, also PRSA APR certified. Uh, Angela and I last saw each other in 2009 when she was the personal PR advisor to the Secretary of the Air Force. She earned her credentials handling crises with U.S. forces in Germany and South Korea, among uh, many other places. The most notable of which was her role in Afghanistan as the international media chief and spokesperson for all NATO forces. Today, she's the Director of Communication for the Kentucky uh, Senate Majority and has advised leaders at both ends of the education spectrum, in the medical community, and in politics. Uh, she's also owner founder of her own crisis management business, uh, the Virago Circle, and recently published Crisis Public Relations, How to Effectively Communicate No Matter the Risk. And I think I, I got that wrong. She will be publishing. And uh, Angela, what's the publication date on that again? Uh, we're targeting May of 2024, and I've also changed the title uh, <laughs> because that's what happens when you are in that, that publishing process. Uh, it will be Command the Crisis, Navigate Chaos with Balanced Public Relations and Communication Strategies. So I'm looking at May the 15th of 2024. Outstanding. We'll all be looking on Amazon on May 15th. So it's a thrill to, be, uh, it's a thrill to be talking with you again, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my own experience comes principally from what I call, uh, not to be too morbid, morbid but sort of the, the, the blood in the dirt, smoking hole in the ground type of crisis. Uh, tragedies that resulted, uh, in my experience, uh, in, the, uh, in the loss of uh, almost 20 airmen from a major terrorist attack in Saudi Arabia, uh, aircraft crashes in Croatia and Italy that killed 45 people between them. Uh, including our own Secretary of Commerce, children, uh, journalists, among others, uh, and numerous crime, uh, sexual assaults, et cetera, major accident-related crises initiated by Americans, uh, unfortunately, and impacting people in places like Turkey, Germany, Japan, Norway, and elsewhere. I transitioned to risk communication with the nuclear industry for a decade, opened my own business, and recently came full circle to have fun with the Air Force again. So I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be in your all's company today. So in the uh, rambunctious spirit of Halloween, uh, we're going to put a slide up here 
uh, that uh, is going to kick us all off with a checklist of crisis fundamentals. Now, uh, how do you all think we're doing here? Feel free to comment in the chat. Uh, and I, I have to tell you, I had some techno technological issues today, so I can't see the chat, but I know uh, Andrew McMakin, our, uh, our um, uh, committee, our planning committee president is kind of watching that for me. Uh, but most of you, I hope, are looking at that saying, hey, that doesn't look quite right. So this is our, this is our trick for a uh, uh, trick or treat. These are tricks. These are myths. These are things that should not or cannot be done during a crisis. And I'm going to kick us off with the first one. And uh, uh, Angela and Jocelyn are going to kick off the next four. And we'll all kind of chime in on those uh, after the initial comments. So first, craft and coordinate a solid response plan. Uh, now, again, if you have some uh, thoughts on that, feel free to drop them in the chat. My story goes back to 1998 when a U.S. fighter pilot was flying at his small four-seat electronic warfare jet as fast and low as possible through the Italian Alps, as fast as the train would allow. Uh, and in doing so, he clipped a cable, a cable connected to a ski lift gondola carrying 20 skiers of all ages from seven European countries. Uh, the cable car those people filled uh, fell about 360 feet to the ground. Uh, the crew of the airplane didn't know what had happened. The plane was okay. They returned safely uh, to their base, which was coincidentally my base. Uh, we were aware that one of our planes reported hitting something, but we didn't know what and we didn't know where. Uh, now, the best PR professional I've ever had the pleasure to call friend was in charge at that time. And she asked, uh, she needed to be with her boss. So she asked me to come over and assist with her office. When I walked into the public affairs office, probably 15 or 20 minutes already into the crisis, every individual on the phone was talking to news media and they were telling the truth. Uh, we didn't know if it was our plane that had hit the gondola. Nobody knew. Uh, I, I could hear that confusion and our general lack of control over the situation being echoed from the news reports coming out of uh, a, a television uh, on, on the wall. Uh, essentially, U.S. spokespeople at the Aviano Air Base have no information. Uh, within, within a minute of walking in, I looked up to see the first images shown on CNN of, of blood in the snow, lots of blood in the snow on, on, live, on live television. Uh, you can imagine what that does to the heart. Um, I had the six or so folks on the phone put down their receivers as soon as they could, just, just let them ring and told them to tell every caller that the hearts and prayers of the American community in Italy are with the family and friends of those killed in this terrible tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, what if we didn't do it, somebody challenged. Uh, at this point, uh, it doesn't matter. I said, speak from your heart and pick the phones back up. Uh, within 60 seconds, that message was repeated on CNN and soon every other news network in Europe. The hearts and prayers of the American people are with you. Uh, I, at the time, didn't know there was a formula to follow, uh, but honestly, I, I believe an angel was whispering in my ear that day, and our response of heartfelt sympathy set the best possible tone for what was the very worst crisis I ever hoped to experience. We had no plan to handle something like that. And I'll tell you, if you're in a crisis, a real genuine crisis, you will have no time during the first hour or hours or even the first day to draft a plan. There's just no time. Hopefully, you have a plan ready. But if not, understand that there are key steps that can be taken that anybody can follow in the absence of a plan that will see you successfully as possible through any crisis. And I'll share the rest of those steps before we finish today. But uh, first, Jocelyn, uh, your, your thoughts on the idea of creating a plan as a crisis is unfolding. Sure, and Mike, um, you hit on some just excellent points uh, for our listeners uh, today. Um, and I, I, I have been in that situation where there, there's no playbook for that particular crisis, So, and you are just reacting. And so I think that the important takeaway here is that um, any of the basic blocking and tackling that you can do as a communications professional you know, just prior to, to any um, activities, you have your media lists, you have a chain of command in terms of who, who gets what call. And of course, 
to you, Mike, in the military. And I know Angela, you, you're also a military um, experienced uh, veteran. Um, there are definite protocols in terms of who hears what and when. But in organizations, uh, in my case, I've, I've worked with private business in um, school districts, and there are chains of command in terms of um, who you notify and when. And so any of that advanced work you can do prior to something going sideways will benefit you in a time of absolute crisis because you're not scrambling to um, to find those phone numbers to figure out who needs to know what and when or where those people are. Because sometimes the people that you need to talk to aren't available, strangely enough, of course, when you absolutely need them. So having that backup to the backup, um, having a, a plan for who is the point person in the event of any crisis or a particular kind of crisis situation in your organization, I think those are all good questions just to ask beforehand, because as Mike said, um, when things go sideways, you just, you don't have time to um, sit down and lovingly whiteboard out a plan, it's go time. And um, and that's when you have to react with confidence um, to everyone, all of your audiences that you're in command and you have a sense of what's going on. So um, Angela, do you anything you want to add to that piece? Um, you all covered a, a lot of it. Um, I, I can say that my experiences are also with, um, unfortunately, um, crash aircraft crashes. Uh, we had a situation when I was stationed in Alaska where our um, three-star commander and a friend of his um, uh, perished in uh, an, a private uh, airplane crash. And so uh, it, we already had the framework and the structure um, around military aircraft uh, crashing, but not necessarily you know, privately owned. And in this particular case, uh, it was with um, a civilian whom I did not have release authority over, which did complicate things and, and in some cases um, made um, the process a little slower. Uh, but um, I was able to, along with my team, uh, able to, to flex what we did know about aircraft crashes and apply it in that particular instance as well. All right, thank you, Angela. And, and I'll do a, a quick pile on point. You know, there's also an associated myth out there, I think, that, uh, uh, you know, you need to do a risk assessment. There, there's no time for risk assessments or SWOT analyses either. They're all part of the same, the same bucket. Uh, your only desired outcome is to be out of the crisis. And any forthright steps that take you in that direction are, are valid steps. Angela, would you take on the next myth for us? Uh, remember that, uh, hey, crises are unpredictable. Is that right? <laughs> uh, to, to an extent. Uh, but I would, I would argue that uh, in your business, in your industry, you can think through the most likely worst case scenario you would ever want to find yourself in and plan today for that crisis that might happen. So, for instance, um, if you work in construction, um, if you don't have a plan for when someone is injured or killed on the job, you probably should go ahead and draft up a kind of, we call them a fill in the blank news release with different types of scenarios that apply to your industry so that you've got the who, what, where, when, and why kind of formatted and then based upon the information as it unfolds and as you're able to uh, determine the facts around the whatever your particular situation is, you fill in those blanks. Uh, and uh, doing that ahead of time uh, gives you a great opportunity to endear yourself with your leadership team, which you should be on if you're not. Uh, so working with your CEO or your president, um, if you're in a nonprofit, the executive director, uh, if you're in university, in, in, in um, education, it might be the principal, the superintendent, whomever that might be, uh, getting to know them, uh, bringing this to their attention that while you will help execute, crisis communication is absolutely uh, a leadership uh, function. And so thinking through those likely scenarios and creating some fill in the blank, uh, you know, scenario releases that you 
I mean, we had them in hard copy in a big box that I, you know, my crash kit that I carried on to site. But now you've got the, the beauty of a Google Drive or OneDrive where you can house those types of um, a fill in the blank releases so that when the tensions are high and they will be, you have at least something to start with and you fill in the blank with your subject matter expert uh, in whatever situation you might be in and, and fill those out so that um, you can plan today for that eventuality that may happen. Uh, and as I, I guess that my, my big takeaway with this is it gives you an opportunity to assemble your leadership team and to know who you will need to reach out to and keep in the loop um, when a crisis does present itself. And would yeah. you like to add anything to that, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. First, I want to underscore what you said about, um, you know, crisis communication is a leadership function. I, I would encourage everyone, um, every organization to put their leadership through crisis communication training right along with uh, media training. We often think of media training, but crisis communication training is just as important. Uh, also, a question to our, uh, our participants out there. Uh, what's a big scare we have to contend with now throughout America, from, from our shopping malls and grocery stores to our schools and workplaces? Uh, feel, feel free to, free to uh, populate the chat there. Um, I'm give it a second. Uh, Andrea, if you're, if you're reading the chat, maybe you could read back uh, some of the uh, insights that come in there. I, I can't see them from where I'm at. Sure. Yeah, it's, we were on the same page because I just asked people what kind of crises has yeah. your organization dealt with? So yeah. I'm seeing some examples, violent, well, and also responding to your question about public um, crises that we're seeing more of these days, violence, mass shootings, active shooter, fentanyl, hey, fentanyl. Cyber, cyber attacks. Yeah, and cyber attacks. So I, I, I'm realizing uh, on the phone, it does pop in. I see the, the mass shooting uh, ones there. That's exactly where I was going with, active shooter. So right along with your templates that Angela was talking about uh, and response plans for executive malfeasance, uh, environmental spills, industrial accidents, these things we can think of. Uh, it should be plans and messages in the event of an active shooter or some similar form of violence in the workplace. That is very unfortunately the crisis du jour today. And uh, no crisis kit should be without something addressing the, that uh, that event, uh, that um, scenario. Uh, Jocelyn, your thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, the active shooter one really um, reaches out to me with the work I've done with with schools and districts um, and as a parent myself. Um, and I think one piece it reminds me of I was going to bring up later, but this is timely. Um, you know, we talk a lot about just knowing who your um, uh, partners are, maybe in other stakeholder groups. One important stakeholder group when it comes to security is law enforcement. And if you um, can do, you know, it's if you can do more work, legwork ahead of time, just to make sure you have those points of contact with your local law enforcement agency, um, just get to know um, who you call in the, besides 911, thank you, in the event, <laughs> um, just to develop a relationship with whoever might be covering your uh, office or um, your locations. I, I have, when I worked for the state's chamber of commerce, we had a surprise protest that unfolded and people were, um, uh, coming into our office, our main office. And um, ironically, since our office was located near the state capitol, um, uh, the state patrol thought that uh, local law enforcement, the city of Olympia thought the state patrol would handle it because they thought we were a state agency. We're the state chamber of commerce where we represent private business. And it was sort of a finger pointing like, oh, I thought you guys had it. And we didn't know, um, nobody knew who was coming because no one was really responding. Um, and so that, that was a big takeaway for us is that we needed to get in front of, um, you know, all the law enforcement agencies and say, here's who we are. Um, and we could really um, use your help next time should that ever happen. But um, just a, yeah, that for me was a big aha, like uh, law enforcement is a, a very important um, uh, group to connect with. And if I could add to that another group that you all might consider 
are your board members, if that is appropriate for your particular um, organization. Uh, and, and don't forget to inform people inside of your organization <laughs> so, that it, so that they know what is going on if you're in the middle of a crisis and you're diverting your energy and effort to that. Whatever mechanism you might have, uh, whether it's a, a, a Google Meets or a WhatsApp or Signal is one that I use with my current team, that uh, you keep your internal audience informed as to what is taking place because they become your ambassadors on social media at the grocery store after they go home that evening or in the, in the days following uh, a crisis. They become a megaphone uh, for those key messages um, that Joycelyn uh, suggested. Uh, so keep keep those um, different kinds of people in, um, informed as to what's taking place. And uh, in the case of a board, oftentimes board members come from so many walks of life, they may have experienced the very crises that you are currently and might have some really keen insight that if you just reach out to them, they'll offer their help. Yeah, it's amazing how, uh, how much experience comes with uh, the whitening of hair. <laughs> get a lot of that on 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 boards. So, uh, uh, Jocelyn, this middle one uh, myth here is one I, I have to be careful with as as a son of a couple uh, attorneys. I got to be careful criticizing it. But uh, tell us your thoughts on the idea of uh, seeking out the lawyers and doing what they tell you to do. So, full disclosure, I am married to an attorney, so we have some really interesting <laughs> dialogue ourselves. Um, <clears throat> he no longer practices actively, but he uses law in a different way in a trade association. So we do have, and I, I have to say to anyone who might be an attorney on the call as well, I think attorneys become much more uh, skilled at reading the room when it comes to public relations issues. I, th I think it, we've advanced this conversation quite a bit, but there are still rubs that come up. So this, in keeping with the trick or treat theme, this is both a uh, treat. Yes, this is the high value candy. This is the Reese's peanut butter cup. And it's also, maybe like the equivalent of the box of raisins this is a healthier treat or you know i think having um relationships with um you know lawyers and they will find you immediately <laughs> if you don't seek them out but um so lawyers can be a treat to work with they can help you but they also may make your life a little uh you know um challenging shall we say so i give this one like the snickers and box of raisins response um so Basically, I think that the lawyers have a job to do and we have a job to do as communicators. And I think that um, finding that balance in terms of we both have a job to do, the house is on fire, we need to say something. Because obviously, we all know you can, silence doesn't work. Uh, it's basically an admission of guilt in a lot of respects. So um, we can't say nothing. So it's finding a way to work with our friends, the attorneys, in figuring out what we can say, because a statement has to be crafted. You have to acknowledge that there is a problem and there's a situation. Um, so it's carefully threading that needle, hopefully with their help in figuring out, um, you know, basically first and foremost, like what is the event? Acknowledging knowledge and awareness of we know that there is a problem and we're working to uh, resolve it as quickly as possible. Work with them on, uh, as Mike right out of the shoot said, expressing empathy. That's, I, I, I can't, I, I know a lawyer will occasionally argue that you can't say that, that you can't, you can't say, but more often than not, um, empathy is a winning uh, message point. And expressing that first before you get into the minutia of what's going on is always a winning strategy. Um, you can go back to your own organization's values and talk with the attorneys about how does this, what's happening based on the situation, of course, relate to what we believe in as an organization or what, what our mission statement and our values express and how does that map to how we plan to respond. Um, you can then find out within reason, of course, with the attorney's help, how you plan to respond or at what point in time you plan to have a report, right? To signal for your audiences that we're aware of things, we are working on a response and we will get back to you at X point in time. Uh, with our plan of action. The trick on that one is to actually do that and follow up on when you plan to get back to everyone. Um, 
and that's the final point is just working with attorneys on uh, what comes next. And in terms of the legal processes, just partnering with them in terms of, um, you know, again, it's what you can and cannot say. And again, they have a job to do, you have a job to do, but I think at the, at the end of the day, um, most legal teams will partner with their communications teams for a positive end result. Um, you, you can't not, um, you can't ignore the advice of your, uh, your legal team, but I would argue similarly that they need to, um, uh, listen to you because, um, more often than not your reputation, your, your, um, organization's reputation will be tried and convicted of the court of public opinion faster than it will be in a court of law. So, um, time is of the essence, as we all know, in a crisis. And I, I think that responding, act, you know, in some form uh, with a lawyer's blessing um, is uh, the reasonable choice. So, Angela, Mike, thoughts? Well, I, I'll, I'll jump in on that um, and then uh, pass it over to you, Angela. I, I, I agree. I think, I think that relationship with your general counsel, it almost becomes a point of uh, a professional ethics that re regardless of personality, it, it's really you're, you're getting paid and the general counsel is getting paid for the two of you to get along and to get along well and, and communicate. If you don't, um, it's not to the best interest of, of the organization. Um, you know, and this, this makes me uh, uh, talking about the lawyers, you think of some of the legalistic language that we are taught to use as well. And this is sort of a, a sub point uh, along what's best for the organization and the public. Uh, another myth, a myth bust is, is never put a happy face on an unhappy situation. Uh, do not project positivity and hope when you should be projecting sadness and reconciliation. Uh, don't don't try and spin a bad thing by downplaying what it really is. Don't use words like event, incidents, uh, mishap when people are plainly looking at a calamitous situation for the organization. Uh, call call it was call it what it is. Uh, uh, early, an example early into the investigation of the crash uh, that killed uh, Secretary of Commerce Ron Brown and 34 others in Croatia. I suggested that we not stick to the Air Force legalistic uh, standard lingo of calling the crash a mishap. Uh, I just didn't, I just felt that that's not gonna play well publicly. Mm -hmm. a, you know, a mishap is spilt milk. It's a fender bender on the highway. It's not people being thrown through the windshields. Um, so the mishap investigation became an accident inv investigation, and that's a term that carried over beyond that particular event. Uh, so uh, I, I just caution: um, there are there there some language gets embedded into the culture of an organization, but we need to step back away from the trees and and look at how it looks to the the general public, and we need to make sure that language is appropriate to the situation. Yeah, that's You're a great point, Mike. And if I could kind of add to that, part of our job um, as communicators is to translate the, the very legalistic um, elements of, of a situation and bring it down to a sixth grade reading level where the general public can understand what it is we're talking about. If it's a highly technical issue uh, and, of course, people want to know the, the reasons why. Um, you know, the the accident happened. And that's not always clear, but um, working with your attorneys, and, and I found that literally, like, as Mike said, and, and Joycelyn alluded to, working with them at every location where I've been, it's always the public affairs person and, and the uh, judge advocate, the PA and the JA, that um, work uh, together on a lot of, of issues uh, that um, we want to protect information, but we also want to be forthcoming and transparent. Um, and I had a, a situation here, if I can just share quickly, where um, I needed my general counsel as I was a, a, approaching um, a, a new publication uh, that was re, reinvigorating a story that was about a year and a half old that had already been addressed, but we were trying to convince them that this really wasn't a story. It had already been in the news. There was nothing new to report. Um, reference uh, someone's Twitter feed. Uh, the Twitter feed, the Twitter account had been hacked. And um, the person who had hacked the 
uh, the, the Twitter profile had then gone in and liked and followed a number of, um, let's just say, questionable other profiles. And so I, I then it was able to use my general counsel, and he and I had a, a conversation with the, the journalists uh, and the editor about, you know, is this really a, a new story? And as it turned out, they went ahead with the story, and, and we weren't necessarily effective in, um, in keeping it from, from being in the news again. Uh, but then once the story was out there, I quickly, <laughs> very quickly the next day, with um, the, the individual that it, that it impacted, a senator, and we immediately engaged with his local press in order to um, explain himself and mitigate further damage. And so we, he and I personally went into crisis mode while we were having other legislation heard on the floor and votes were being taken. He stepped off the floor. We set up Zoom calls just like this so that he could talk to his local press and, and mitigate the damage. Um, and, and it became a one day, two day story instead of a, you know, a week long story. Well, uh, speaking of the local press, uh, <laughs> Jocelyn, why don't you kick us off on this fourth one again? Tell us, uh, uh, your thoughts on, uh, keeping our cousins in the information business, news media, keep keeping them at bay during a crisis. What do you sure. think about it? Yeah, you don't want those guys anywhere near. No, of course you want them to be a part of, of of any organization, right? We talked about this. We did a little foreshadowing earlier that um, you know your friends in the media, uh, and hopefully you have some friends. Um, and I always like to say that in any profession there are great, you know, true professionals, and then there are people who are a work in progress. Um, but yeah, you do want to keep uh, your relationships up with those who cover you and. Um, and that's again part of that legwork in advance. I, I like to call it um, uh, putting chits into the uh, uh, bank of credibility, if you will. That every time you talk to a reporter, um, you bring them in. You may do a desk side. You have the chance to bring them onto your site or into your organization. Always encourage principals, for example, to have an open day where you can bring reporters in and and have them see what's going on in the school. Same with legislators for that matter, bring them in to have them see what's going on in a school on a daily basis because some haven't been in a school for a while. Anything you can do to help socialize them with the organization and what you do helps them understand the work that you're trying to do. And frankly, who you are as a person and that you build that relationship so that when things go sideways, um, you can call said person and um, it's not a matter of, quickly catching them up to speed on who you are or what's going on. Um, and uh, it's just about that relationship building that I think really helps mitigate, not all, of course, but some of what happens in the events of a crisis, because they, you know, um, the example, we had one recently where there was, this one came out of the blue too. This is one of those, um, like, Gotta love social media, but boy, gotta love social media things. Um, a reporter, a new reporter, was dialing for dollars, if you will, because a um, a um, how do I explain this? A paper production plant, um, who I had done some crisis work for previously, um, had a fire. Which, if you know anything about the people who make and manufacture paper products. Um, they have these large piles of wood chips. It's called a hog fuel pile. And they use that material to um, produce energy on their site. Something, as it turned out in the aftermath, combusted and lit that pile of wood chips on fire. And this is in a small community where it's a very visible <laughs> facility. Uh, Hard to miss that there's a big pile of smoke coming out of this uh, plant. And so something was clearly off. And this reporter was dialing for dollars. And she Googled my name randomly and saw that I had done work with this organization before. So in that instance, she had reached out to me to try and get um, <laughs> to get information about the fire. She was trying to find information. And so we eventually managed to work with this young reporter, I think trying to make a name for herself. Um, the right information. And so this is sort of the, that apex of new media coming in in a crisis, an organization that is that has all of these procedures, right, in the, in the event of an emergency, a manufacturing emergency. They have all these plans, but just this new wrinkle that, that this person was trying to get information. And then they had regulators, of course, because of 
who they are. So there was that lawyer impact as well, like what we can and can't say, it's an active investigation until we know exactly what caused this fire. But um, we were able to work out on a statement saying what we knew and that there was an investigation going on. The reporter got what she needed. The, the uh, plant got enough information out there to, um, to let the community know that things were under control. And they were able to also leverage public safety officials who were able to serve as spokespeople at the event for the, the, um, the, uh, the uh, wood paper uh, manufacturer um, so that the pressure was a little bit off of them. They were able to let those first responders talk about you know, the, the big um, fire impacts. So, uh, you know, media can definitely can go sideways on you, right? There's, we've all been, I think, involved in a situation where it, maybe the story didn't come out as well as um, you intended, but you can't, you can't just say, I'm sorry, I'm not talking to you. That just doesn't work anymore. They can go and get their information from too many other places. And then you have no control over what that information says or how that sets up in terms of what really happens. So better to keep your um, enemies closer, I think, is part of the saying, um, than not, uh, in my view. So that one's a, a trick that can yield a treat in my book. Outstanding. And, and for the benefit of uh, any of our uh, cousins in the media who might be on this presentation, I, I, I'm going I'm to I'm gonna spin your comment about better to keep your enemies closer to keep your friends real close. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. As a former reporter myself. I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, because I, I, I do believe that in a crisis, uh, reporters are your best friend. Uh, assuming you've made, as you've said, Jocelyn, a genuine attempt to be their friend when you're not in a crisis. And, and that's the- Maybe and it's that, not friend. Maybe friend isn't the right word. Uh, you know, acquaintance, colleague, you know, associate. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, fair enough. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll add uh, not not a case study, but at a philosophical level, you know, good journalists are not trying to manipulate PR people. Uh, if they're a good journalist, any more than good PR people are trying to manipulate journalists. It, it's not a chess game or even a, a, a game of checkers with the media. If you have the right relationships, you know, it, it's two people having honest and forthright dialogue one on behalf of the public interest, ideally, and the other on behalf of the public interest, right? Uh, in that sense, we're all on the same side. Uh, and, uh, and so if, if we can agree, you know, the, 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 the PR uh, practitioner and the reporter that, look, we're, we're all trying to do what's best for the public and our organizations, for them the paper, for us, our, our company. Uh, if we can agree on that, I hope we can, uh, then seeing to the best interest uh, of the public will, will, will come naturally. And over the course of time, you know, I did a decade in the nuclear industry uh, where we, we, you know, we had a lot of conversations about uh, nuclear scrams of the plant, uh, radiological issues, uh, some industrial issues, that sort of thing. Uh, and over the course of time, I truly, I have built friendships with reporters. We keep a professional, but um, I believe you can build some very uh, lasting friendships that will come to uh, benefit not only your company, but, but yourself personally and professionally in the long run. Angela, your thoughts? Sure. I'll just add that uh, media are people, too. <laughs> and my approach with the press is to kind of treat them like a co-worker. Um, we, in our, in our communication roles, have the greatest opportunity uh, to um, affect the story, and that is through um, gaining access to our principals when um, when we'd like to you know promote them setting up an interview. Um, I've two locations that I that I've been in where I it was heavy on the media was when I was at the Pentagon, so working with the Pentagon press corps uh, for getting access to the principals that I provided support for the Under Secretary of the Air Force. Um, he's a very busy man. They've got congressional testimonies. Got you know, meetings with the National Reconnaissance Office because he was dual hatted. And I found that um, having a cup of coffee, you know, alongside a reporter in the cafeteria in the Pentagon was a really good way just to say, hey, what are you working on this week? What's what's um, what's bubbling up that you're interested in? Uh, and and to get access to my principals because they're they're 
calendars were so condensed is we would do quarterly defense writers groups. So if there is a, a forum that exists in your area or in your industry where you might be able to promote your principal to engage, uh, then you become that, that um, conduit uh, so that the press get access to the person who's making the decisions about your organization. Uh, and then just real quickly um, to kind of keep us on time is, you know, I also found myself in Afghanistan um, when I was the spokesperson for NATO's International Security Assistance Force, I would have afternoon tea with a reporter. I started every conversation off with, this is an off the record conversation, but let's ha- let's sit down and talk. And just so that I got an idea of where their heads were. And I also gave them context to what was really taking place on the ground. Um, what was, um, what were the challenges that our troops were up against? And so I found that that was a really good way for me to establish that relationship. And we talked about more things than just, you know, the combat that was taking place. I got to know, you know, them, what their families were like and uh, how long they'd been reporters. And so just, um, like I said, treating people, you know, media like they're people too, because they are. (laughs) So, so Angela, in the interest of time, uh, I, I'm going to ask you to go solo on this last one, if you don't mind, about releasing only 100% information. Your thoughts on that? Sure. So sometimes an 85% solution is the right solution. And certainly uh, when you're in a crisis, you're not going to have all the information right away. Uh, in the Air Force, and I think that this is probably um, true in, in other industries as well, our barometer for success for getting out that first news release is that first hour. It's critical uh, in order to maintain trust and transparency with the public. So you try to get the, the five W's and the H, who, what, where, when, why, and maybe how. And, and perhaps you won't know all of those right off the bat. Um, when I was in Afghanistan, we lost a helicopter late one Thursday evening. Uh, it was, you know, the Taliban immediately said they'd shot it down. I could not verify that. I didn't think that it was probably correct, but I didn't know. And so as the initial reporting came in through our command post, and I put together with the Belgian officer that I was working with, um, the, the who, what, where, when, there's been an, there's been an incident uh, and an investigation will be forthcoming. That was, a, you know, two lines. That was our initial release uh, after a holding statement that was, I'll, I'll look into the incident. That was what I was telling reporters when those first, first uh, stories came across the wire that we, you know, the Taliban had shot down a helicopter. So having a graduated response Uh, being as forthcoming as you can initially, and then following up. You have a a holding statement that might be very basic, that initial release that's one or two sentences, um, and then a follow-up release as more information is known, perhaps a stand-up interview with either yourself as the spokesperson or a subject matter expert who can give, you know, some additional uh, context and clarity. Uh, And then if it, you know, if the crisis continues to escalate, you know, perhaps it warrants a press press conference, you know, when Mike was talking earlier about, um, you know, so much, um, so much loss. Uh, and, and we did as well. We did a press briefing after uh, this particular, we lost this helicopter. Um, that, you know, then, then you get to that point, you know, after, you know, 24 hours, 36 hours after that initial crisis presents itself. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, and in the uh, in the interest of time, because I'm thinking about our Q and A, uh, let's go straight into the uh, the takeaways for our participants uh, today. Um, uh, we're going to move the slide along. Here, we're going to get the treats. And again, Angela, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to ask uh, us to just kind of run through these quickly because I think they 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 recapture what we've said, and then we'll jump into the Q and A. Uh, go ahead, Angela. Absolutely. Um, we talked about being on the leadership team and, and knowing um, who your your counterparts were in different organizations. Um, something we didn't really touch upon is, you know, identifying who's doing your social media, who's who's got in charge of the website that can get your news releases up there quickly, using your email in order to distribute that news release. Uh, identifying who's going to do what before it happens, that's another um, a key point to make. Uh, we did touch upon subject matter experts. 
you already have a, a great website. If you don't, you should. <laughs> and, and you already probably have a degree of um, social media engagement. So doing that up front um, offers, this is an area where you do have control and where you can um, put those key messages out. Um, and that's your, your prime real estate. And if we could go to the next one. And as I indicated earlier, thinking about those worst possible things that you don't want to see in a headline and then thinking through what you would do when those situations presents itself. If there's an accident with bodily harm or death, you absolutely have to do a press release. But there's also, you know, legal and ethical breaches that your your CEO, your CFO, they make bad decisions and embezzle money. <laughs> You've got to be prepared for that in some instances. The basics of your release. Um, you always have the option to stay and fight or to do nothing and flight. And there's always a risk involved, but a, a crisis is where risk meets opportunity. So think long and hard about not doing anything. And, and usually doing something is the right answer. A graduated approach and always make sure that what you're saying publicly matches what you were doing inside of your organization. And on the next um, slide, I do have what I call my crisis decision tree. And this kind of walks you through in a, in a pictorial way, uh, those things that we've touched upon, um, you know, throughout this whole um, panel discussion. So if you go to the next slide, please. There you go. And you'll have access to this and you can kind of see, you know, kind of have how you make your way through and things to consider as you develop um, your next courses of action. All right. Thank you, Angela. Jocelyn, you've got some treats for us. Yes. You bet. Thank you. So uh, this is just like a, a quick um, analysis of the situation. And it, if you walk through some of these questions and you wind up you know, answering yes, then you definitely need to respond. So first thing is, will stakeholders expect us to respond? Do the people we serve expect some sort of response? Does it merit, does it rise to that level of what's happening? Is it a smoldering sort of crisis that we can tend to in a different way? Or is this a, a major uh, um, situation that merits an immediate response? Um, it's, <laughs> um, well, I'll just go to number two. If, if <laughs> how will silence be received if we choose not to respond? And we talked about this a little bit. Um, if we say nothing, do people think we don't care? Are we perceived as being guilty or just plain tone deaf? Um, there's a lot of that, that, that speculation that starts to creep in if, um, if your stakeholders don't hear from you immediately. Uh, in the event of a crisis. Um, the third point is, will others' comments shape perceptions of us? Will we lose that opportunity? Again, also number four, will we lose the opportunity to shape the story and tell our side of things and explain what's happening and what we're doing if we don't do anything? And so uh, these are pretty quick tests that you can just tick through really quick uh, that should give you a send you back to uh, Angela's response, crisis response tree um, in how you respond from there. But um, it's just a, a, you know, sort of a, a quick and easy, um, you know, series of things to tick through um, as things are unfolding. So I think by and large, this panel would agree that most chances, if there's a chance to respond to something, you should take it. So next slide. Crisis rules of thumb. So we um, talked about some of these really quickly today. Um, crisis does mean choice and it totally gets down to what you do and what you say is your crisis response. So if you choose to do nothing and you say nothing, that says a lot to your uh, your stakeholders, your board, your shareholders, your um, you know your customers, what sort of response you're, you choose to issue on that. Um, I think the second point uh, is just acknowledging that you care, show that you care. The single biggest predictor of how you come out of a crisis um, is a perception that you don't care. If you don't make a connection with your audiences, that you acknowledge that there is the loss of human life, that there, that someone has you know, taken ill, um, that this is a, a big problem. People are looking for uh, that empathy, that empathetic, a piece because again we're all human. Uh, three, um, although Angela didn't use this language, uh, don't miss the golden hour in first responders language. That's that hour after an incident occurs where you can get someone to the care they need and hopefully to a, a hospital 
or some other treatment facility. The same thing applies in crisis uh, mode. You have, you know, that first hour, two hours, eight hours, 24 hours, we're all in a 365, uh, 24 hour news cycle, right? So um, that first moment of impact really matters. Um, and to that other point and the other slides we talked about, silence isn't golden. If you don't say anything, you, it can and will be used against you. Um, and then just really quickly on the next couple, we did the PR and the lawyers thing. Uh, communicate as many ways, different ways as possible. Use all the channels you have available to you because you never know who's going to be attending to what particular uh, channel for your message. And then number seven, tell the truth, right? Mom always said it's easier to tell the truth and that, you know, to lie and then to have to backtrack on it later. Um, it's it's a very true attendant and we all hold ourselves out to be professionals and telling the truth and acting with honesty and integrity at the end of the day is perhaps the most important thing we can do. Mike? All right, all right. thank you. Hey, I'm gonna share a, a few of my own here and I'm gonna start by saying, if uh, if the next if my next two treats I'm leaving you all with seem a little bit redundant of what uh, Angela and uh, Jocelyn have already shown, well, there's a reason for that. Uh, you know, the semantics can be different in how we how we talk about your approaches to crises, but the fundamentals are there's going to be common fundamentals through them all. And I think if you look at all the treats we're leaving you, those fundamentals start to come out to the front. So these are the steps I referenced earlier that I believe will safely uh, see you through a crisis, or I know they will. Uh, the short term at the top of the list and getting toward the long term at the bottom of the list. Uh, I also did promise to do a shout out to uh, an old uh, PR friend, Dale, who remarked in the ads leading up to this event, that if the uh, the president of the Spanish Football Federation had immediately shown some level of empathy, had apologized and shown some deep humility instead of digging his heels in, well, uh, I, I think he would still be deserving a bad place in history, but it wouldn't have been nearly as bad. Uh, you know, a little care, a little responsibility and accountability. Uh, and I would even add reform to this list. I, and I have for certain clients. So uh, you can pencil it in later, right before reputation management. These things will navigate you through a, uh, a good client uh, crisis. And the next list is also very similar uh, and uh, to uh, Jocelyn's rule, rules of thumb. Uh, the most key among it is understand when you're in a crisis and when you're not. If you respond to a non-crisis as if you are in a crisis, um, you're gonna create one. So th there's, a, there's a judgment call with that. So these are our takeaways. Uh, I didn't leave much time for Q&A, uh, but uh, Andrea, please throw some uh, questions we have there in the chat. Yeah, um, we don't have any specific questions yet. Um, I'm inviting people to type their questions in the chat, but I am also wondering if one of my colleagues, Greg Kohler, if you're still on and if you're listening, I know Greg has been um, overseeing the Joint Information Center um, for his organization and others where we are. And it's a place where people rehearse about how to handle a crisis. Um, and Greg, if you're there, I would yeah. love to have you- I'm mention here and, and I think my colleague, Susan Bauer might be on as well. And Susan's really, managed the day-to-day, -day, uh, done the really heavy lifting on getting our Joint Information Center set up. We we had one a few years ago where we uh, would consolidate with Hanford and we broke into, we set up our own. And it was quite the effort and it is quite the effort to keep people trained and keep things updated, but it's imperative if you had a, a, a an active shooter or a wildfire threatening the laboratory or some natural event, a toxic release or a cyber attack, uh, you really need a, an, a location where you can all come together to respond, the equipment to do it, and then the know-how. And a lot of the things that were the guiding principles that were mentioned today were uh, things that we we wholeheartedly support and try to do here. I don't, I don't know, Susan, if you're on, if you want to jump in and say anything additional. She might have had to jump. She was on a little bit earlier, I know. Yeah, okay. Can you just briefly say, like, what happens during those rehearsals? Dur during the training sessions yeah, we have? Yeah, the training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a scenario, you know, uh, like one of the things I just mentioned, uh, play out. And uh, we have some kind of limited ones, more tabletop exercises versus full-scale drills. 
and we try to put everybody through their paces, the telephone teams that would be getting media or public calls. Uh, we we don't do news releases anymore during events. Uh, if we have one, we we have a running blog with the latest information on our website, and we try to point everyone back to that, and we continue to pile on top of that. I know Hanford does the same for theirs, um, and um, we, we, we have two social media teams. We have one that's sharing approved content. We have another team that's actually monitoring for rumors out there so we can hopefully uh, address those before they really get rolling. But we during these drills, we, we try, to try to test all components of the crisis team and, and put them through some paces. Greg, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. I'm sure we'd all roll in on. Uh, it doesn't do any good to uh, study crisis if you don't practice crisis. Yeah and do so as a, as a team. Right. Yeah. The challenge for us has been, you know, uh, as people come and go, making sure our call trees and people that we can call on are, are both available and, and we have people assigned to those positions and then we put them through some, some training. Outstanding. So hey, we've got hey, a go couple ahead. other questions that came in, Mike, as Greg was talking and thank you for that, Greg. Um, Kim says, curious to know more about messaging and commentary. If there's a chance, oh, if there's a chance to ask the question, I will come off mute. Yeah, go ahead, Kim. Uh, thank you so much. And Angela, Jocelyn, Mike, appreciate the insights you've provided us today. Uh, my question is about um, the silence rule, right? So silence is an admission of guilt. Um, but curious about your perspective. Um, obviously, you talked about the tiered approach where you can release one to two sentences within the golden hour or, you know, and then the next 24 hours more to come. But does it ever reach a point where maybe all you can say is just a very limited statement? Because depending on how the narrative plays out or if you feed more into it, it could almost make a situation worse. So just curious on the school of thought. Um, as far as just having a limited statement and that's what you stick with, or is that not enough? I think situations vary, but just welcome your thoughts on that. And and, and uh, uh, be, before we, uh, uh, we jump in on this, I just wanna say some people may have to jump out off here shortly. Uh, I think we'll, we'll stop recording at the top of the hour, but continue to, uh, to chat. And while we're answering, I'm going to ask uh, Kelly, if you would bring up the flyer for our next event. I, I want to grab folks that have a meeting and we'll just have that on the screen. We'd love to see you next month. And with that, I'm going to punt over to Jocelyn and Angela to uh, take on that yeah. question. Uh, if I can start, I'll say it really it, it just depends, Kim. Uh, certainly, uh, there's always a risk um, when uh, if you are limited into what you say, uh, that's where um knowing what is on your, your CEO or your president's mind, uh, having um, a seat at the table with he or she and your chief operating officer, your financial officer, you know, whoever makes up that core uh, team talking through uh, what, what uh, are the ramifications for only having a statement and then, and then never saying anything else. There may be some instances where that is appropriate. Um, I have found that, um, making a statement typically leads to more questions uh, and that um, responding to queries. And I've asked, I've asked reporters very specifically, tell me what it is you'd like for me to go find the information on and I will do my level best to do that and, and even you know provide written answers back if there's a limit there uh, or if I'm able to convince the commander or the, um, the um, operations officer who's the, you know, the on-scene commander to, to take that interview and explain further um, and prepare them appropriately so that, so that you're not you know, setting them up for failure. But if I'm able to convince them that uh, saying a little bit more would be in our best interest to maintain that transparency and that trust, um, I'm usually the one that's leaning forward on that. Yeah, Thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Uh, sorry, wanted to mention, um, we've got a couple other questions coming in, which we probably won't have time to get to all of them by the end of the hour. So I wanted to remind people that we will send the questions to all the panelists afterwards that we didn't get to. And then in our follow-up email, which will include the link to the video and the presentation, 
uh, we will provide the answers to those questions that we didn't get to. And and I and I want to uh, also be flexible on the fly here. Uh, I want to do a quick wrap up, and then let's keep for those who can hang out. Uh, I don't think we're any of us are running off to anything on on the panel. Uh, perhaps we can hang around and continue to answer some questions. Uh, uh, but to wrap up the hour, I, Angela, Jocelyn, thank you very very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, for the participants out there, I, I'm not sure if you're aware, but. Uh, the, the panelists we get for these events, we pay them each about $40,000 each, depending on their credentials. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can get by the laughter. I already told them in advance, they get a Starbucks gift card out of this. So we are very grateful uh, for them to take the time and share their experiences with our, uh, our, our fellow PRSA members and, and friends of PRSA. Uh, a, a thank you to Andrea, our planning committee president, who's been uh, moving us, helping to move us along here and working the Q&A from me. A very special and personal thank you to Kelly Ray of Energy Northwest, who did about all the logistical and creative legwork involved with setting up this event today. Thank you very, very much, uh, Kelly. And again, before the, uh, any of you uh, who have to jump off, uh, we have a great workshop next month at... Uh, Best of all places, Sage Brewing Company in Pasco. Um, I hope you can join us. You'll see the information there on the uh, flyer. Uh, Chris Collier will be uh, our uh, our star our star uh, speaker that day, and we're, we'll be sure to get more information out that. But it'll be one of the few times in a post COVID environment that we'll all be able to come together uh, for for den uh, dinner and um and friendship and learn a few things as well from data to drama and i hope you can join us uh, next month november 13th for that so with that said um if our panelists have time and we still have questions out there i'm i'm open to uh continuing this train what do you all say well it looks like julia's got a really good one that we didn't touch a whole lot on and i don't know if you're still on julia but you know you raise a very very um good point about official channels, uh, Twitter and Facebook and, you know, Instagram. And, and I think that you go where your audience is and um, it might take a little convincing or conjoling to uh, convince your leadership team that you, you have to go where your people are and, 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 and engage them uh, in that manner uh, in order to control that narrative and to manage uh, the messages that are going out about them. Um, I, we, do, we use Twitter here in the Kentucky State Senate. Um, I will um, videotape on Facebook, and then I'll put my link in my Twitter feed, and, but then I also will do a news, an official news release that I'm sending out by email. So we hit, we hit um, our audiences uh, in whatever space they're operating in. Yeah, I, I agree, Angela. And I think it's it's that sort of um, eat at Joe's sort of sign, like everywhere <laughs> you put it, no matter it's on Twitter or Facebook or, you know, wherever, it all goes back to your statement, where, where probably posted on your website, um, so that everyone's getting the same information in whatever channel they choose to look at, but it's all consistent. Is there any other one that we might uh, touch on? Um, or is everybody pretty much uh, bailed? There's a few people who are still um, on. Yeah, we had one other question from Nick. There is the type of crisis that simply suddenly happens like a fighter crash. What about the type that might actually be seen coming? Maybe a financial crisis. How do you know when to bring the crisis to light with the media? Well, if you want to bury it, you put your release out about four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> That's one tactic. Yeah. Uh, that is one of those um, conversations with your leadership team, I believe, to to think through the ramifications of what makes the most sense. Uh, and are we, you know, if if there's been a financial um, situation that you do feel the need to uh, be transparent and forthcoming with uh, making sure that your board of directors is aware before it comes out. Um, you know, as I indicated, the your internal team 
uh, so that they're aware that this is information that's that's out there and then having a very deliberate approach. Here's a statement or here's a news release. Uh, and, and this is the information that we can provide. Uh, probably in that situation involving numbers, I would want to put as much on paper as possible. So I would, I would go with an official news release uh, and perhaps a statement on um, a social media channel where your, where your public is, would be my, my recommendation. And, and I, uh, I'd add to that as well, Nick. Uh, great question. If you can see in this case, you see a financial crisis planning, it, uh, a crisis coming. If you can see the crisis coming, uh, you have very real opportunity to avoid the crisis. Um, and, and that gets back to uh, what Angela just said. There, there are certain steps you can take. And remember, if you respond to a non-crisis like it's a crisis, you will very likely create the crisis yourself. So there's a, you know, there's a huge judgment factor. There's people getting in a room and looking each other in the eye and, and are we in a crisis or are we not? If you are not, but you see it coming, don't treat it like a crisis, but communicate. As Angela said, communicate, communicate, communicate in a, in a, in a, in a calm manner. A fi what I would consider a financial crisis is uh, when you find out, let's say your, your vice president, uh, your, your chief executive officer, by the way, uh, that that vacation he took down to South America, he took a bag full of money with him. Uh, that belonged to the company. Now, now you're in a financial crisis, and you treat that as a crisis, and you get out and you communicate with the stakeholders and the shareholders, and, and you start doing, uh, you know, here's how we're going to resolve it in the reputation recovery. But if you see a crisis coming, I would posit that you can avoid that crisis if. Uh, if if the you know things are in your favor and you, and you do all the right steps and i would just add really quickly it might be also be an educational opportunity for you to have some conversations i went to the place i went to mike was not the guy in south america with a bag of money but the school district that's going to be facing a financial crisis if you will enrollments down uh federal funds are withdrawing and there's a chance to educate your stakeholders about the things the district is doing because eventually we all see it in slow motion that we're headed for that, but there's a chance perhaps to do some educating ahead of time about the steps you're taking to mitigate things. Um, so, but again, that's it's a conversation you would have to have internally with your leadership team about how, how far you wanna go uh, in that direction. Right, and this is such a great question because um, we should also consider that different parts of the organization will perceive crises that we do not. You can have a financial crisis. You can have an HR crisis. It may not be a communication public perception crisis. And you, you may need to uh, divvy things up uh, that way as well. Um, and and I think to your point, Jocelyn, uh, for instance, a, what, may be, what may be a certain financial crisis in the future, if we see it in advance, we as PA practi PR practitioners don't employ crisis communication principles. We really start kicking in on risk communication principles. We see it coming. We understand the impact. And now we're talking about mitigating the risk. And that's that's a whole that's kind of a different set and a different approach uh, for involving stakeholders and a whole bunch of other people in the conversation. Thank you, guys. That, yeah, those those are great great answers. Um, and I think where I was going with with that question um, was kind of exactly what Mike said about uh, you know if it if it's whether it's a determining whether it's a crisis or not a crisis. Um, I you know you don't want to you don't want to handle it as a fire if it's not a fire. So thank you. Yeah. I'll tell you, in the nuclear industry, uh, Kelly can certainly back me up and others from Energy Northwest, there were a lot of internal company crises that they were not communication crises. We took a risk communication approach where you do have time to sit down and plan out who are the stakeholders that are going to be involved in this future event, whether that future event is going to go down tomorrow afternoon or a month from now. Uh, what do we need to communicate? How do we need to get out in front of this issue? Um, how, how, what kind of grassroots engagement do we need to do with key stakeholder groups and influencer groups? 
Uh, and, and that is really the art of risk communication, not so much crisis communication, even though others in the company, in their, in their circle, the, uh, in their functional area, they're, they're experiencing a crisis. Yeah. So just wanted to let, let you know, Mike, that that I think is the end of the official questions in the chat. All right. We've got 13 people left. <laughs> Okay. Well, if, any, any tough if, ones? Yeah. If anyone wants to hang out and chat, treat this like the, uh, you know, the, the, the time when you're in the, uh, the seminar room, time's up, everybody's leaving, and a few people are hanging around the lectern talking to the people, uh, you know, that were there. We're happy to entertain, entertain any discussion. If there is any, feel free to come off mic. Uh, we'll... hey, this is Nick again. I, you know, I, I just... It's interesting with with all of the talk of crisis here, and I oftentimes think I'll think, well, you know, the best case scenario for any crisis is going to have it fizzle out and not really be a crisis. Um, you know, with a, you know, uh, and I hate to even bring it up, but you know, a, a shooter walks into a school and starts unloading his weapon. And he misses everybody. Nobody dies. The sheriff comes in and arrests him, and he goes to jail. Is that not still a crisis, though? I um, believe it is. You know, because it it just be not, the bad results didn't end up happening, but they just as easily could have. Well, and so it, I just think here, all you know, just the talk, talking through all you know, all of this is is, think, is important for for everybody yeah. here. I think you're I in Jocelyn's school area here. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I, I think sort of the flip side of things is sometimes good good news can can be a crisis of opportunity, right? I mean, there's a chance for you in that instance to talk through how the school responded the, correctly, thanks to the law enforcement who responded so quickly, and the the situation was resolved swiftly and uh, without a loss of life. Um, so there's, I think there's still a lot of positive lessons mm -hmm. uh, to be told there in, in that crisis situation, if you will. Um, there's other times where maybe you've got really good news and it can be overwhelming to an organization to mitigate that. That can be a crisis in and of itself. But um, again, it's, I, I think in all, some of these crisis rules still apply in terms of consistent messaging, telling all your stakeholders, uh, doing the legwork work with reporters so that when there is news, good, bad, otherwise to share, you are prepared to uh, to respond. And I think in a situation that you described, the scenario that you laid out there where it was good, but they're still going back to how did the guy get in the school to begin with? And if yeah. the school doesn't take that opportunity to refine their processes and look at their security um, procedures, there, therein is where a crisis presents us, uh, an opportunity for a brand to refine itself uh, by looking at those processes and improving upon them so that they are a better business school, brand, product, you know, whatever the case might be. Right. Yeah, I've also had the uh, opportunity to work with schools and on, on military bases. And I can tell you, the when you're dealing with parents who many of us are who are entrusting this system with ev everything that is dear to them in life even the threat of a of a shooter a, a kid making a threat that hey i'm going to bring a gun to school tomorrow uh I, i'd say we're we're getting pretty close to crisis situation right right there and I mean so yeah go ahead but well, schools are microcosms of our society. So what anything that can and will happen out in the rest of the world can happen in an instant in a small school community, in a commu school community, right? And yeah. and it's in a particularly um, sensitive community at that because we're, we're talking about children and people that we say goodbye to every morning and go to work in those schools. So um, yeah, I, I agree. I think we all can be students of crises as well. That's probably a point eight I would have put on my slide is that we we have the opportunity to learn from others and um, 
uh, mm -hmm. to do better ourselves as a result of studying how others respond in a situation. I mean, every unfortunately, every day you turn on the TV, there's something there's something to be learned, right? So Absolutely. the more we can be students of crisis communication and just talk about those on venues like this or with our colleagues, um, I think we're all better better for it.